Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. In 509 BCE, the last king of Rome was overthrown. The people, and the powerful among them, were done with tyrants, and they elected to be governed rather than ruled. They formed a senate to debate the issues and to guide them. It was far from a democratic body, but it was far better than being ruled over. But there were two men that sat at the head of the senate. They were elected for a limited term. Now these two men had equal powers. Each one was a check on the other, a guard against the threat of one man amassing too much power. These were called praetors, and later they'd be called consuls. And these two wielded an executive power. The Romans called that power the imperium. Now, perhaps the most important role of the consuls was to act as commanders-in-chief of the armies of Rome. Now, presumably these were the two most powerful men in Rome, at least while they held office, but there was another class that rivaled them. There were the generals, and later on the governors. Now, nominally, they served at the behest of the Senate and under the command of the consuls. In reality, though, they commanded a great amount of authority and influence all of their own. Still, they could be recalled and reprimanded or removed if they stretched their mandate too far. Now, early on, the famous Roman Republic was in her infancy, and she was struggling to discover exactly what she would become. It was a system of governance designed to keep any one man from reclaiming the title of king through a system of checks and balances that much of the modern world would find familiar today. But there were times, especially in the Roman Republic's very early days, that their system was just not prepared to handle. There were times when the Republic itself was in such great danger that a squabbling and divided Senate could not come to a consensus on how best to defend her. Times when that mass of ambitious and often inexperienced generals were more concerned with their own glory than the salvation of Rome. At those times, sometimes, the consuls either could not or would not agree on the path before them. It was at these times, when Rome itself was in peril, that the consuls, with the backing of the Senate and even the tribunes, would raise one man above them all. They chose a man that they thought to be worthy and wise and strong, and they named him Dictator. For a limited time, usually no more than six months, he was given supreme executive power. His authority over all of the armies of Rome exceeded that of the consuls and even the generals. He had virtually no check on his power, and his responsibility alone was the defense of Rome. Now, of course, the last dictator was named Caius Julius Caesar. That was at the twilight of the Republic, when men like Sulla and Caesar abused the powers of dictator, but for centuries it had been an invaluable tool, a last line of defense and hopefully a salvation. Now, there are incalculable parallels that can be drawn between ancient Rome and the world that would follow her fall. Some are valid, most aren't. Some are useful, most aren't. But, by the summer of 1670, in the West Indies, the island of Jamaica was experiencing some of those same growing pains, figuring out exactly what they were. They had a governor who had executive authority over the island, and a council that debated the issues and decided how best to move forward. But in that summer, they stood alone, abandoned by their king, and surrounded by very, very capable enemies. They chose to give one man unprecedented power, authority, and burden. This is Episode 30, Dictator of the West Indies. Admiral Henry Morgan had proved himself time and again the most capable commander in the Americas. He outshone his predecessors like Admirals Mings and Mansvelt. He uh, eclipsed earlier buccaneer captains like Francois Lolonnais. He had amassed a bigger reputation, more conquests, more successes, and more plunder than all of the men that had come before him. It was in Jamaica's hour of need that the governor of Jamaica, Governor Modiford, with the backing of Jamaica's governing council, granted Morgan more power than any other captain in the Caribbean had ever held. 
Now, he had his letter of mark in hand, but that was the least of it. He was given the power to actually issue letters of mark on his own without consulting the governor. That was unheard of, and also pretty illegal. A letter of mark was only supposed to be issued by a governor, a man given the king's authority. And in one move here, Modifort had delegated the king's writ to a man most considered to be no more than a pirate. But Morgan would use that power to great effect in the months to come. Now, he was also given total control of the Jamaican militia. Even that wasn't anything too outside of the norm, but he used that too. Morgan was virtually given control of the island, and he put it under martial law. He put strict rules in place, limiting the consumption of any goods necessary to the war effort. Any man that was left in debtor's prison was offered clemency if he agreed to serve on board one of Morgan's ships. Even indentured servants were offered freedom on the same grounds. Farmhands, apprentices, drunks, vagrants, criminals, any man who could sail or shoot was courted by Captain Morgan. At Fort Charles, there in Port Royal, this unruly mob underwent strict training under the commanders and the veterans of Morgan's fleet. In the waters surrounding Port Royal, ships practiced wartime maneuvers. In the fields, in the workshops of Jamaica, in the forests, and in the fishing grounds, men and women hunted and fished. They salted beef, they poured rum, they repaired sails, they tuned guns, they packed powder. Jamaica was readying for total war. After they had been attacked, all of her citizens wanted to help. It was a finely tuned machine, but still, it was not enough. Ships from Jamaica sailed in every direction that the wind would carry them. The sailors on board carried word from Morgan into every logwood cutting camp on the main. They sailed into every harbor or river or hidden cove that was known to them, known to be used by buccaneers. They visited taverns, they spoke to shifty-eyed men in alleys, and they proclaimed their word in city squares. The message was the same that was at this time being trumpeted in Port Royal. Sometimes it would be whispered into unwatched ears. Sometimes it would be accompanied by drums. It was repeated in English and Dutch and French. It was even repeated in Spanish and in the tongues of slaves and natives. Henry Morgan had put forth the call. Now Morgan had set the meeting place for all of these potential buccaneers at an old haunt, the Isla Aveche off the southern coast of Hispaniola. The deadline for joining the fleet was set for October 24th, 1670. This gave the men plenty of time to set their affairs in order and to sail from wherever they were to meet him. And sail they did. First, just a few, but then they flooded in. Now Morgan himself visited the most important port to this effort. Tortuga was, in many ways, the twin of Port Royal. Back before the English had arrived in Jamaica, it had been the hub for all of the Caribbean buccaneers. Most men that would sail under Morgan, English, Dutch, or French, knew both of these cities well. They knew both cities' harbors. They knew the barkeeps, the fences, and they all had a favorite girl or two in each of the city's different brothels. Even still, it was important that Morgan himself go to Tortuga. Relations between England and France had strained for the past few years, and things had cooled between the English and the French rovers ever since they'd nearly come to firing on one another during the raid on Portobello. It didn't help that Morgan and Modifort had uh, confiscated a French vessel, imprisoned her crew, and then made the ship Morgan's flagship after the disaster on the Oxford. So Morgan sailed for Tortuga personally and prepared his pitch to the French buccaneers there. The fleet was struck by a hurricane in September en route to Tortuga. By this time, though, most of the men were experienced with hurricanes, and the fleet made it through not too much worse for the wear. Now there is one person who is probably the single most influential to our image of Caribbean piracy ever to have lived. Howard Pyle was an illustrator around the turn of the last century. His works on pirates did more to solidify just what a pirate looked like than any other, 
more than Robert Louis Stevenson or J.M. Barry, Defoe or Captain Charles Johnson. His works, Howard Pyle's works, have graced the cover of all of these authors from time to time. Now, the saying goes that a picture is worth a thousand words, and I think that Pyle proves it. His images, unlike the woodcuts depicting pirates that were made before he worked, well, they all told a story. From two men embroiled in combat on a beach to see who would become the next captain of a pirate ship, to a man marooned on a deserted island, to a poor soul forced to walk the plank, and his works on Captain Morgan are some of the best. One of these, named Henry Morgan Recruiting for the Attack, is an image usually associated with this voyage, Henry Morgan's voyage to Tortuga. I'll put it up on the website so you can take a look, but I think it really defines and captures who Morgan was and what he was doing late in the summer of 1670. In this picture, he's lounging on a shaded hammock on the beach. Behind him, we see waves splashing ashore. He's wearing the clothes of an English gentleman, his buckled shoes are kicked off on the intricate rug beneath his feet. There's a barrel, standing within reach, topped with a fine crystal decanter and a glass for what we can assume is rum or maybe wine. A Cuban guitar rests against that as well. His hair, long, hangs about his shoulders, and his face looks imperiously on the men standing before him. Now their clothes are little better than rags in contrast to Morgan's. They have beards and earrings, bare feet and headbands. But there's another contrast here as well. While Morgan is lazing on his hammock, surrounded by articles of comfort and luxury, he has no weapons. The men before him each carries a musket and a blade. One has a blunderbuss stuck into his sash, and another has three grenades hanging from his belt. These are hard, large men, well-armed. Morgan is slender unarmed, even foppish, but he is also very clearly in command. Now, the image is full of inaccuracies and anachronisms, but it captures something that any other form of media fails to. I definitely suggest going to check it out. Now, back in Tortuga, there was some resentment against the English admiral and his men left, but England and France were at peace again, and all of the French buccaneers listened growing more and more intrigued in Morgan's proposal. The Brethren of the Coast out of Tortuga heard Morgan's call. Soon, every man with a ship and a crew and a mind for adventure was making ready to sail. Now Morgan himself sailed to that appointed meeting place to lay anchor and to wait. He had a month and more before the fleet departed, but it would be far from wasted. Now, Captain John Morris was there, of course. He was at the helm of the ten-gun dolphin. He was one of only a few captains that had been on Morgan's first raid against Via Hermosa and Grenada some seven years before. He'd been Morgan's longest and most trusted companion. Often, he was a man that would take command of secondary units or even the whole fleet if Morgan was away. So was Captain Lawrence Prince of the Pearl, another ship carrying ten guns. Another long-time companion of Morgan's, these were two of the strongest ships in the fleet so far, especially since Morgan's own flagship, the Satisfaction, was somewhere sailing along the Spanish main, patrolling for enemy fleets, and it had yet to be brought back to the Admiral, although he had sent word for it. As these ships waited along with a few other English vessels that had accompanied them to Tortuga, pirates from far and wide began to appear on the horizon. The messenger ships that Morgan had sent out returned with more men on board and more guns, and usually one or two new ships in tow as well. More often than not, these ships that had been prizes that had been taken on their way back to the rendezvous. And then smaller vessels, like canoes, rolled in as well, not much use to the fleet, but carrying buccaneers with sharp eyes and well-oiled weapons. Some men, though, didn't even have canoes to row to the boats. These men arrived on the shore by foot in droves. Stephen Talty in Empire of Blue Water writes, quote, 
Some of the Hispaniola contingent could find no vessels, so they trekked across the island, battling the Spanish as they went, until they arrived at the shore looking out on Isla Avache. In calling out these cow skinners, Morgan was harking back to the very roots of West Indian piracy. As they emerged out of the woods, their leather stained black with blood, their hair filthy and matted, their faces splashed with mud but with muskets polished, they must have appeared like shades from the Caribbean past, the legendary sharpshooting boucanier, the men who lived as free as wild animals, the fathers of them all. Morgan was summoning ghosts. End quote. There had been months of quiet in the Caribbean. The kings of England and France and Spain relied on diplomacy back in Europe, and the buccaneers had been discouraged from taking any action. This was the first real assault planned in more than a year, and it was shaping up to be the largest ever seen. As more and more men arrived, every ship's crew filled up, and more men were camping on the beach, hoping to find a crew to join. Morgan realized that he had a problem. There were so many men showing up, men that he needed to make his war a success, that he would have trouble to actually feed them all. He ordered hunting parties to get as much beef as they could, but even that would not be enough. So he sent John Morris to go search for any Spanish ships and raid the pastures of any Spanish settlements, while his second-in-command, Vice Admiral Collier, was ordered to take a few well-armed ships and 400 men to the Spanish main and raid what was the New World's most productive and profitable source of grain, Rio de la Hacha. Now, maize was an essential food source on board a ship. They used it to make their bread and hardtack, and they would need it in quantities that they just couldn't find anywhere else. Plus, Rio de la Hacha was a rich town full of fat merchants. So Collier sailed hard and made the coast in pretty good time. But when the fleet was in sight of their target, they were becalmed. The townspeople from the shoreline saw their ships stranded just off the coast, and they were there for a full two days, while the townspeople had all the time in the world to bury their valuables and flee the city. And there was another complication as well. In the harbor sat a sizable Spanish galleon of fourteen guns and forty men. So Collier waited, before, finally, a slight breeze helped him limp to shore some two miles from town. As they approached the city by land, the Spanish fort opened fire. As per usual, it was underarmed. There were only four guns on its walls. The galleon in the harbor opened fire too, but neither was able to do too much. For twenty-four hours the buccaneers took cover and waited, until the Spanish finally just surrendered. The English didn't even have to fire a shot. They knew the reputation of the buccaneers, and they knew that it was fruitless to resist. So the English would report later, that they'd found Spanish soldiers hiding under mattresses in the fort, and that they'd executed several of the commanders. Most notably among these was the captain of the galleon in the harbor. It turns out that that ship was La Gallardina, one of the four vessels that had attacked Jamaica a few months prior. So the captain was killed, and his ship was seized. As it happens, luckily enough, the holds of the ship were full of maize. It was to be transported elsewhere, and that was just what the buccaneers happened to be looking for in Rio de la Hacha. Now, they didn't find much in the way of other plunder in the city. There were two days of calm and one of cannon fire, and that had given the locals plenty of time to hide their valuables, and time was short, so Collier ransomed the town for beef and maize, which they received, and the fleet sailed back to Morgan. It turns out that the buccaneers missed out on 200,000 pesos in well-hidden treasure there at the fort. That's equivalent to two million dollars. But their ships were full of food. Now back at the rendezvous, Morgan was waiting impatiently for word from either of his two top captains. Collier had been weeks gone and Morris just as long. His flagship, Satisfaction, had finally arrived in good order at long last, but after a full five weeks of repairing their ships and waiting for word from Collier, finally he arrived, bearing that new Spanish galleon, thousands of pounds of foodstuff, and news that one of the men responsible for attacking Jamaica had been slain. Not long thereafter, Morris arrived as well with even better news. Off the coast of Cuba, 
he'd been forced to take shelter from a gale in a small sheltered bay. A couple of hours later, a Spanish vessel had appeared to take shelter from that same storm. Lo and behold, it was none other than the San Pedro y la Fama, carrying her captain, Manuel Rivero Pardal. That's the same Spanish captain that commanded the force against Jamaica, who claimed, quote, to make the sea and these barbarians tremble, end quote. Now, his ship carried 14 guns, so they thought they had the smaller buccaneer vessel dead to rights. They were trapped in a cove, they were outgunned and outmanned. And they were right on the face of things, but they didn't account for the disparity of the men on board these two vessels. When the Spanish attacked what they believed to be an easy prize of buccaneer dogs, they were faced with a hail of musket fire and a ferocity that they hadn't expected. Once again, the buccaneers proved their quality against the Spanish. Now, the battle was hard fought on both sides, but the smaller and weaker force prevailed. The question is, though, how? Now, this is a hard thing to quantify. It's an impossible thing to measure. For historians, it's a difficult thing on which to gather concrete evidence. But I think, perhaps, it's that the Spanish privateers weren't really experienced fighting men. Perhaps their overconfidence against the smaller force was their undoing. There's even a school of thought in military tactics that says to always give your enemy a way out. If they're cornered and desperate, you might just see exactly how hard they can fight. Now, some have argued, some of the more mythologically minded, that Spain was actually rotting from its core. Their king was mentally and physically disabled. At the time, he was seen as a monster touched by Satan, punishment on Spain for years of pride and greed and hubris. And the king, if he is one with the land, well, he represented the weakness that was growing in Spain. This, of course, ignores the scores of less successful buccaneers. The Spanish had left hundreds of these dead on some beach or tossed into the ocean. In the end, the reason that the buccaneers defeated the Spanish force might be as simple as a lucky shot. Some English musketeer shot Manuel Rivero Pardal through his throat, killing him. Spanish resistance after their commander died collapsed. Captain Morgan's great antagonist was dumped over the side unceremoniously, and John Morris sailed back to his admiral to deliver the news. As a storyteller, this is a real blow to me. He had... Such potential to be a great villain. He was vain and he was colorful, yet he was still a man that was capable and dangerous. He was a warrior poet. I would have loved to have told you of a great slashing duel on board his flagship, with Morgan and Rivero climbing into the rigging, delivering quippy one-liners along with the parries and thrusts of their blades. But that's not how real life works, and that's not to be. Rivero was dead and Morgan's fleet was now fully victualled, repaired, and ready to sail. They had several warships among them. Morgan on board the Satisfaction, Vice Admiral Collier, John Morris, and Lawrence Prince each had their own ships. The frigate Lily was captained by one Richard Norman, the Fortune by Richard Dobson, and the 70-ton Mayflower by Joseph Bradley. By this point, these were all veteran captains under Morgan. The Spanish galleon, captured at Rio de la Hacha, La Gallardina, was given over to an experienced French buccaneer without a vessel. The French brought the other two strongest warships in the fleet as well, the St. Catherine carrying 14 guns and 110 men, and the St. Pierre with 10 guns and more than 90 men. Most of the vessels in the fleet, though, weren't as impressive as all that. The Virgin Queen, for example, carried only two small guns, and the tiny La Cerf carried no guns at all. But they packed as many men on board these tiny vessels as possible. And that's representative of really what the ships in this fleet were. They were just there to ferry men from the meeting place to the shore. When Morgan wrote to Governor Modi Ford, finally, to inform him that the fleet was ready, he reported 30 ships and more than 1,800 men under his command. And the fleet was finally ready. 
but there still remained some business to be done. All thirty captains crowded on board the satisfaction and sat down to council. It was time to ratify the code. Naturally, Morgan was voted as admiral, Collier his vice-admiral. There may have been some haggling over how many shares were to be divided among the crews as the terms on this voyage were more generous than prior ventures, but the usual concessions were made for all. Morgan was to receive one percent of the total haul. King Charles, the Duke of York, and the governors of Tortuga and Port Royal were each allotted a small share. The captains of each vessel were given eight shares for their ships and one for themselves. Surgeons, carpenters, other petty officers, they were given additional shares representing their contributions. Wounded men on this voyage, though, would make more than they had previously. For the loss of everything from a finger to an eye to an arm or a leg, they were getting more gold than they would have uh, on an earlier voyage. So the code here was generous, but not at all unusual. The real order of business was the decision of where to attack. Never before had the Caribbean seen such a force of brethren of the coast. No pirates or privateers on so many ships carrying so much firepower had ever been seen before. This was an army to rival any force that the great empires of old Europe could muster, so where could they attack? Now, Santiago de Cuba was an obvious choice, as they'd been behind the raid on Jamaica. But the winds of that time of year in that region could be dangerous on the coast of Cuba. Now, Havana was the jewel of the West Indies, but even nearly 2,000 men were not enough to take a city like that, so many argued for Cartagena the second largest and most powerful city in the region. It was impressively well defended. Now, they might take it, the buccaneers probably could, but the loss they incurred would likely not be worth the prize. In fact, though the buccaneers didn't know it at the time, attacking Cartagena would have been a suicide mission. It would have been a total disaster. The governor there was prepared and called in all militiamen. His ranks were swelled, his garrisons were full... The buccaneers probably wouldn't have reached the coast even, since the fleet massing there would have crushed even Morgan's forces. Luckily, though, while they were on Morgan's vessel, that idea was overruled. The council finally decided on another target. Perhaps it was the ripest and the richest in all of the New World, and it was one that held some historical significance, especially to the English. One hundred years earlier. Almost exactly 100 years as it would turn out, Francis Drake had sailed to the New World and landed his forces on terra firma. Drake and his men partnered with a group of French pirates to undertake the greatest and most notorious act of piracy that the world had ever known. And now, Henry Morgan and his French allies were going to do the same. They all agreed, and they all signed the code. They were going after the treasure house of the world. Panama. But wouldn't you know it, they had a problem. The same problem that Drake had faced, actually. Panama, the city that housed all of the gold and silver brought up from the South American mines, lay on the Pacific side of the Isthmus. Their ships weren't about to sail around the southern cape of the Americas, not and leave their homes completely undefended for the months and months that such a voyage could take. If they were to sack Panama... They would need to land on the north side of the Isthmus and trek through at least 30 miles of dense, dangerous jungle, and that was with their ships carrying them as far inland as possible. It could be done. After all, Sir Francis Drake had accomplished it, as had countless numbers of Spanish mule trains and centuries of local natives. But Drake had had guides that he took with him, and Morgan was unlikely to convince the decimated native populations to help him. So he needed to find someone who knew the jungles of Panama, who had personal experience with them, and who hated the Spanish enough to help him. Such men existed, as it turned out, many of them, probably, Englishmen who had made that journey many times, and all of them were gathered together in one place. They were in cells, under guard, deep in the dungeon of a fortress. 
These were, some of them, the same men taken years prior through Spanish treachery, forced to work as slaves building Spanish forts, and there were others, too, that had been arrested for espionage, piracy, or other high crimes. All had been to Panama, the city, many times, and all were kept on the prison colony at La Providencia, known to the English as Providence Island. So the fleet set sail on December 16th, 1670. The fleet anchored off Providence Island. One 14-gun ship sailed in to wait at the mouth of the harbor to ensure that no vessels could escape and warn the mainland. One thousand of the men were ferried ashore, armed with their best muskets and best steel. The main batteries on the island, those that had to be taken out first, were actually on the smaller islet nearby St. Catalina, That's the tiny island that lay so close to Providence that it was actually connected by a bridge. Then, the buccaneers, at this point, could we just call them an army? But the buccaneers marched for the fortress, but there was something there they didn't expect. Now, there was a brand new drawbridge, and it had been drawn up. Then, they were met with a storm of musket fire and even larger arms, It would be possible to take the castle, but not for hungry men after a day of marching in the dark. So Morgan's men made camp out of range of the Spanish, ate what food they'd brought with them, and went to sleep. Almost as soon as their eyes were closed, the sky opened up and a terrible rainstorm fell upon them. Sleep wasn't an option in this weather, and anyway, their primary concern now was keeping their guns and their powder dry. Nearby, there weren't any structures to speak of, just a few huts turned into makeshift arms depots for them. Hungry, soaking, miserable, the men tried in vain to find a place dry enough to catch what little sleep they could. It wasn't much in the end, and the deluge continued into the next day. Then there was no food left to speak of. They'd eaten it all. They were able to build fires, but not of any real size, not enough to warm themselves with. And there was no chance today to take the fortress, not in weather like that. There was an almost timid attempt early in the day, but it retreated quickly under enemy fire. So the men grumbled. They took shelter under beachside palms, and they waited. When a few men captured an old mare, well, Exquimelin tells it best. He was there, and it sounds like he partook. Quote, there was an old horse which the Spaniards had turned loose because it was no longer fit for work, as its back was full of open sores. This beast they shot dead, and every one who could grabbed himself a bit, roasted it a little over the fire, and ate it up as though it had been the most delectable dish you could possibly wish for. Yes, and a man must be quick off the mark to get a hold of such a morsel. End quote. At this rate... Sacking the castle could take more time than Morgan cared to give over, so he sent a messenger under a white flag to the Spanish. Now they knew as well as Morgan that they couldn't defend their walls forever, not from this small army brought before them. The message promised mercy for a quick surrender, and a short time later he got a reply back. The Spanish agreed that surrender was best, but if they merely gave up the castle, they would probably be arrested and hung for cowardice, So they proposed an alternative. Each side would line up for a proper battle. They would beat the drums, they would march in formation, and they would even open fire. But their guns would contain no shot, or they would aim for the ground. No man need to lose his life in order to take this castle, but the Spanish needed to protect their reputations. Morgan deliberated, but he agreed. But then he ordered his men to load their guns with live ammunition, just in case the Spanish had some kind of trickery planned. For a little over an hour, the farce played out. Not a man died, no one was even injured in this battle. When it was over, Morgan marched into the keep and took the soldiers prisoner. They were treated gently, but they were put under guard, and the understanding held, and there were no incidents. Morgan hadn't needed to fire a shot. They took the town as well, but this too was a peaceful affair. The people were gathered in the church, quietly, the doors were locked, and a guard was placed on it, but no one was harmed in the slightest. Once again, Exquimelin describes the aftermath here. 
Quote, when all was calm and the compact with the Spaniards had been carried out, the war against the hens and pigs and sheep began. Boiling and roasting went on all night. When short of wood, they pulled down houses for fuel. Getting food was everybody's main concern. Some, when they were satisfied, took what remained of their meal to the church, where they gave some to the Spanish women. But the men had to look on. End quote. But not to worry, the next day some of the men from inside the church were allowed to travel to the plantations and gather enough food to sustain themselves and the other prisoners. It wasn't to be a harsh treatment. Morgan ordered no harm done to any of the people. The buccaneers, though, spent the day searching the fortress on St. Catalina. There were armories in each of them, and there were several fortresses. All of them were better stocked than any the English had ever seen in any other Spanish fortification. There were cannons, there were muskets, there were swords and shot and powder, enough to guard against any attack. Not enough soldiers to man all these fantastic arms, but the arms were there. Can you imagine... When the English had taken Providence Island in the 1630s, they had been woefully unprepared to defend her. When they came again, only a few years before Morgan just had, the men had wanted to establish a free pirate republic and defend her. Now they'd failed as well. But after that attack, the Spanish had built up Providence with new forts and moats and defensive positions all around the island. They didn't intend to lose her again. Of course, they lost her, but what if it had been properly manned? Imagine if this had taken place only 40 years later. Imagine what might have been if it hadn't been Morgan in command, but Edward Teach. With a fleet of 30 ships and almost 2,000 men, there were castles filled to the brim, bursting with Spanish arms. What would they have done? What could they have accomplished? A secure, a defensible port, small but close to the Spanish main, where they could raid and plunder with nigh impunity, with enough land and fishing grounds on the island to provide food, and certainly there would be Dutch traders willing to buy and sell some of their ill-got goods. If Morgan had been a different man, not a married man looking for a life of gentlemanly leisure, but a real pirate, he might have made himself king of Providence Island. On this day, after taking it with ease, without losing a man, he might have made himself king. He could have run a private pirate nation from behind her strong walls without any of the interference of governors or kings. Well, I suppose, aside from the interference of them invading with armies to take the island back and destroy the pirate republic, that almost certainly would have happened. So it might not have lasted, but maybe it could. Maybe... Well, in the end, again, it doesn't matter. That's not how real life works. Henry Morgan wasn't a different man. Henry Morgan was a man with a job to do. So the buccaneers, after they were done searching for weapons, searched out the prisoners and asked around to see if any of them had been taken in that earlier raid against the English or had any knowledge of Panama and the land surrounding it. One man came forward, the worst sort of villain, according to Exquemelin, he writes, quote, One of them, a half-breed, showed particular eagerness as he hoped to use this opportunity to revenge the wrong he thought had been done him. As indeed it had, for he did not deserve banishment, but rather to have been broken alive on the wheel for all the murders, rapes, and robberies he had committed. This scoundrel coerced the other two, who were Indians born in the Spanish dominions and very well acquainted with the roads, threatening to have them burnt alive if they would not serve the buccaneers. He told Morgan these men were essential as guides. If necessary, they must be beaten into obedience. End quote. So Morgan took them aboard, and finally had what he needed to move on Panama. He had his army. He had ample provisions. He had more than enough weapons, and finally, men to show him the way. So he ordered the people set free and to return to the ships. The Brethren of the Coast prepared to set sail. Next time, we're going to finish our journey with Captain Morgan, we're going to follow him to Panama and look at how he played a central role in ending the Age of the Buccaneers.